on the show before. In fact, uh, our mutual said to me that you were an essential guy to talk to, truly an amazing guy that had a huge impact on the administration is going to have a big impact on America. Uh, we've got a lot of things to get to. You were in the Trump administration. You worked on a number of different projects that are, are very interesting and particular to me, including uh, uh, housing and urban development and housing policy, uh, as well as the 1776 Commission and a few other things. But the first thing I want to talk to you about is just just give us a little bit of background on you so that people understand who we're talking to. Take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and uh, let's get into things. Sure. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, John Gibbs. I was born and raised in Michigan. Uh, uh, so, yeah, Midwestern dude. And uh, growing up, I was kind of a computer geek. So I loved uh, playing around and learning how to make my own web pages and uh, uh, go online and uh, tinker with programming and things. So I kind of knew that when I went to college, I wanted to do computer science. And I also knew I wanted to be in Silicon Valley. And so after high school, I ended up leaving Michigan and I ended up going out to Stanford. Uh, which has uh, one of the top computer science programs. That's why I applied there. Uh, so all those uh, times mom made us uh, get A's and do all our homework and stay for the sessions after class to make sure we mastered all the material really paid off. Uh, so I ended up leaving home and going out to California to do my uh, major in computer science out of Stanford. And I also studied Japanese on the side, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, I kind of like languages and I was a big fan of Japanese anime in high school. Um, so I wanted to uh, keep that up as well. So, but yeah, uh, did my major in computer science. And then after our graduation, I stayed out there in Silicon Valley. I uh, worked for a small startup uh, that made cybersecurity software. Uh, and it was pretty fascinating learning both cybersecurity as well as the whole Silicon Valley venture capital uh, uh, ecosystem and how it's such a, a precious part of our culture. Um, entrepreneurship has always been a great uh, thing about our American experiment, but you're kind of right there in it in Silicon Valley. So it was really neat to experience that. Um, we got acquired by Symantec, and so we became part of Symantec and uh, continued to work on the same product there for a little while. Um, I decided, decided to leave and uh, do another uh, gig still in the software. So I went to work for Palm, if you remember the Palm oh. Pilot or the Palm Trio <laughs> smartphone. I definitely do, man. I, I'm an early adopter. I, I used to get all those things, man. I remember Palm for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, I was working on the Palm Trio smartphone, which I actually was using as my own smartphone at the time. So it's kind of cool to do some programming on the actual product that I was using. So that was uh, a neat uh, gig there and uh, got to uh, do some good work uh, as a software engineer on, the, on that phone there. And then after a while, I uh, heard a rumor that Apple was making a phone. And I said, that can't be true. Apple doesn't make phones. So uh, I go on their recruiting website and sure enough, they're recruiting for phone engineers, which is what I was at the time. And so I said, uh, let me throw my application and see what happens. And I did that and uh, I got a call back and I ended up getting the offer at Apple. And uh, as the timing would turn out, uh, that very day, the exact day I got the offer from Apple, uh, my boss was calling us in at Palm uh, one on one, on one uh, going through each person saying, uh, would you like to go to china to train them how to do your job and i said <laughs> no but i got some news for you <laughs> and so um i ended up uh, uh leaving at quite opportune timing as god's timing works out so yeah i went over to apple and uh started working there right before the first iphone came out and so i was doing some uh testing writing software to test the, that first version of the iphone wow Wow. What kind of, what kind of stuff, when you said you grew up doing web stuff that it reminded me of my old days, man, I, I'm, I think I might be a little bit older than you, but I remember getting my 300 baud modem hooked up to my buddy's 300 baud modem and doing chat where you would type in, you know, it would come up one letter at a time and then it evolved to like Telnet. And I, I hosted a, a, a message board, a, a bulletin board system. Uh, where people would have to dial in and then they could like post a message and then log off and it was busy because there's only one line coming in uh, and you said that you yep. got you know er, you started off very early on tinkering with technology where how how old are you ish and like what was that the state of the technology when you first started digging into it sure i'm 42 okay. and so i want to say we got our first computer around 94 or 95 so i want to say it was a 46. there you go so um that was when we had like IRC and you had the telnet and everything. And uh, uh, you could do your own HTML by hand and make your hello world uh, page and, and even more stuff if you wanted to. 
Um, I also got one of those uh, teach yourself C++ books that you could get and had a CD with it that you would, you know, put in there and install the, uh, the helper uh, program on there. So it was, uh, yeah, it was mid nineties. Uh, so kind of when stuff was just starting to take off. And you go from there, you teach yourself some, some programming and some, some coding and such. You get, com you get computer literate, you go to Stanford, study computer science, and you end up working on the first iPhone. What, what do you take away from that experience? What do you remember from working at Apple at that time? What, you know, have, have they stayed true to their mission? What was their ideas? What, what is your takeaway from that experience? It's at, at something which has become, so, I mean, dude, I've, I got my iPhone right here. Like everybody I know has got an iPhone. You know, it's become such an amazingly massive part of our culture. Uh, what, what was it like working on it in the early days? And what is your sort of takeaway from it today? Well, you know, the biggest impression is that Steve Jobs had a huge role uh, in the iPhone. And uh, a lot of folks at the time were a little bit skeptical on whether or not it would work, on whether or not Apple could actually sell a phone and uh, get it to have a broad adoption in the market. Um, and it was uh, it was not certain by any means that it was going to take off, but it really did. I think he really saw where things are going. And, you know, having worked on the Palm Trio smartphone, it had all these buttons all over the front. The iPhone had nothing on front, it had one home button on the bottom, and that's it. And, and people were like, all right, can you make a phone with no buttons on it? Are people going to be able to use it? And it turns out the answer was yes. It uh, ended up uh, being a pretty visionary thing. So he was heavily involved. And the thing about Steve Jobs that is kind of different than what you see uh, among a lot of the Silicon Valley leadership today is that he was focused purely on the products. He wanted to make a great product that people loved. Um, when you look today, you see a lot of wokeness and you see a lot of um, different agendas that don't necessarily have anything to do. Uh, with making a great product. They're trying to do what they see from their point of view as a type of social engineering. Um, but uh, back then, uh, Steve Jobs was laser focused on just making a great product that people would love, no matter what background or what side of the spectrum you might happen to be on. And he would just be, he would file bugs, like a Steve Jobs bug that we'd get, and you had to respin the whole build and test everything again because he was on there finding stuff. He was just that passionate about the product. And I think that's a sign of a great uh, leader and a great uh, CEO is that they're all about the product. So that it's unfortunate that we've moved a bit away from that uh, in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, but that's kind of one of my big takeaways. Yeah, it really has shifted away. Uh, I, I remember uh, when they made the transition, I can't remember the new guy's name, but much more design focus. And then the, then there became much more of this, uh, you know, the SJW focus as well. And it's, uh, it's, I think maybe once they realized like how powerful it was really going to be, uh, then they maybe got a little intoxicated with that power. Uh, interesting really to see how it's all developed. Um, do you, do you miss working in that environment or being in, in tech like that? I mean, we're going to get to what you're doing now, but, uh, you, you've, you've gone, you went a long way. Uh, away from that in your future experiences was that is that something that you missed something you want to get back to um i could one day uh one thing about tech and software development is that you're making an actual product and it has to work and so there's a certain predictability in that and a certain um ease in the sense that you're you're fighting to get a good product out there not necessarily with different agendas like you are you know in the, in the political realm right. where things are much more sticky so i mean there's a certain attractiveness to that and um, so we'll see what happens one day, but, um, you know, I, I was working at Apple, I was there for a while and I kind of decided to take a, a little bit of a different path after my time at Apple. Um, and so I said, um, because I speak Japanese, which I, I did at the time, um, why don't I go to Japan and uh, do some Christian missions work over there? And so I ended up actually doing some evangelical uh, missions work in Japan, uh, after my time at Apple, um, because Japan, as you might know, is one of the least Christian countries in the whole world. It's less than 1% Christian. Um, and, uh, I had the language. And so I said, maybe I can use that skill set to go over there and do something interesting. So I ended up going over there and, uh, uh, yeah, doing that for a bit. I, I had that on my list a little bit further down, but as is always the case, hours of prep outline an agenda, throw it out the window in the first three seconds. Let's talk about that, man. That's Sorry interesting. About that. No, it's great. It's great. Uh, your faith, is that something that you grew up with within your family? Was it passed down to you by your parents? How did you, you know, decide to, to end up like dedicating your time and, and life to, to doing missionary work? That's incredible. Yeah, my faith was something I was raised with. Um, we had always gone to church uh, ever since I was a kid. Uh, uh, Pentecostal church, very lively um, format. So, yeah, that's that's uh, 
what I was raised with. And I think it was well instilled in me. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, you know, as I went to college and uh, after college, as I worked in Silicon Valley, that was something that I kept. And I was uh, involved in a great church community at that time, uh, which actually um, uh, offered a class about missions. Uh, and I decided just out of sheer curiosity, not knowing much about it, uh, to sign up for that class. And so I did. And I was just absolutely fascinated how 12 guys who were disciples of Christ went from that to, you know, a billion people or something around the earth. And over this 2000 year period, I just thought it was a fascinating process. So I wanted to learn about that. And then I was like, OK, I think I got to transfer myself and see what I can do here. So I started investigating and doing a lot of praying and research to see, you know, what organizations were out there and who was doing what and ended up going and taking what's called a vision trip. I went to Japan for about a week and just met with some folks doing stuff and and ended up with the mission I went with called World Adventure. And, um, you know, there's quite an evolved process, I think, for good reason. You have to go through, you know, a psychological screen and background check and uh, the panel interviews you on your uh, your theological positions to make sure you're not, um, you know, uh, out there in left field or anything. And so you go through that. And then uh, once you're cleared with that, you get your budget. And so they will tell you, you know, for a case of me, for example, for a single guy to live in the Tokyo area, it's going to cost you 90 grand a year so. Go out there and raise that money. And once you hit 95%, you can buy your plane ticket. <laughs> I thought, so I thought I said, they were going to be like, and then here's the money. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Well, they say that, then they start laughing and they're like, no, just kidding. You got to go. And do it. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so, okay. So you, you go to Japan. I, I'm fascinated by this experience. I, I myself uh, was raised in a, in a half Jewish, half Catholic family. I was bar mitzvahed as a kid. I went to Catholic mass. None of it stuck. I went through a, a very long, arduous, atheistic process, hedonistic process and lifestyle. And only in the last few years have I been finding a calling and returning, you know, or at least not returning, even just discovering faith. And so I'm sort of having like a conversion process in super slow motion as we speak. I've been reading the Bible and trying to pray and, and being really open to the message uh, and, and the words from people. And, and I'm very curious as to what, what was, you know, what was it like going to a foreign country in a foreign land with different people and different languages and different customs and cultures and religions and all of that and, and trying to spread this message that you believe in uh, what, what was that like? Well, I think uh, Japan is a very unique place because uh, uh, most missions that you hear of tend to go to places that are developing, such as Africa or um, Asia or uh, South America. But Japan is a very, very wealthy country already. Uh, so you can't do things such as build a well or build a school or build a hospital. Um, they're already pretty good at that and they've got that covered. So um, it pretty much comes down to relationships. Um, and I think that um, you know, as you're on your journey, Jack, and as we all are on our journey, you know, there's there's so many great gems uh, in the Bible and in the Christian tradition that Japan, as great as they are as a people, you know, they're some of the most polite, respectful, orderly people. There are some hurts they have in their society, such as suicide, uh, and their suicide rate is, um, I think last time I checked, something like three times higher than here. Um, so there's a lot of pain and hurt there that um, they, they are not... Uh, uh, is not being addressed, unfortunately, because, um, you know, for various reasons. So I think there's openings there to talk about, um, you know, our creator and how he desires um, for us to uh, be happy. And uh, and uh, so, yes, the, the difficulty is Japan is kind of the opposite of us in terms of how they see themselves. In America, we're very um, much an individual based culture. So uh, as an individual, I do what I believe is right. Uh, in Japan, it's a bit different. You do what you believe is Japanese. And so there's always this joke that um, if you ask an American, do you like Coke or Pepsi? Uh, we might say, you know, Coke. And if you say why, we'll say because I like the way it tastes. If you, have, if you ask a Japanese person, do you like Coke or Pepsi? They may say Pepsi. If you ask why, they'll say because Japanese people like Pepsi. And so it's just kind of a very different way of seeing the world and seeing themselves. Another one I heard is um, Americans think everybody in the world is like them. Japanese think no one else in the world is like them. <laughs> so... Um, I think those are kind of interesting ways of, of describing it. So a Japanese person on their own as an individual could very well come to the decision that they want to uh, become Christian, but then they will say, it's not a Japanese thing to do to become a Christian. Therefore, since I'm Japanese, I can't do this. Even though they individually as a individual, individual person have decided that it was the right decision for themselves, that group identity overrides it. 
So that is something you see quite commonly that we don't necessarily see so much here, where for us, we make a decision based on, is it right for me and my life and my circumstances? So that's kind of the biggest thing to adapt to. So you always are approaching things as a group. You're approaching things, you know, um, along the lines of respect for ancestors. Uh, the Bible and, and some of the gospels open up with a huge genealogy leading up to Jesus. So you talk about that with the Japanese saying God cares about genealogy too and cares about ancestors too. So you can, you know, start with that as a common talking point and go from there. Uh, so yeah, it's just a matter of uh, bridging the gap, uh, trying to think about them as a group. Uh, and one of the things I did over there, which I think we really had a lot of fun with and some results with was Silicon Valley Nights. And because I can speak Japanese and do PowerPoints in Japanese and whatnot, at the church, I would do a presentation and just kind of a fun talk about what Silicon Valley culture is like. And the local Japanese guys in the community who had never set foot in the church would come to hear about Silicon Valley stuff because they like business and things. So that was a way of bridging the gap and the pastor would sit in the crowd and mingle with the guys and would kind of build a bridge between the church and the community. And so that's the kind of uh, way you can reach out over there. We did homeless ministry as well. So um, there the homeless are a little bit less forward than here and they kind of stay in their cardboard box so you got to almost knock on it and then they open it up and it's very neat inside. They've got their shoes. They take off their shoes and they go in and kind of a very Japanese style of, of um, the way they do that. And we start talking to them. And they kind of look at me after a few seconds and say, what are you doing here? And I'll say, well, interesting story, as it turns out, <laughs> to kind of tell them why I was in Japan and why I'm speaking Japanese to them and we're giving them food and a Bible and things. So, yeah, there are different ways that we reached out over there. And I think that, um, you know, there is some progress, but. You know, it's, it's very much a group culture. So I think um, once they come to the decision as a people that they can they can believe in Christianity, I think you're going to see some rapid movement there. But uh, yeah, it's just it, wrapping your head around that cultural difference is just a, a big thing. Wow. Wow. How, how did that experience change you, John? Uh, it gives you more humility because you realize, you know, you think that uh, you're going to go and you're going to try to um, ask God to help you and go and, and, uh, you know, share the gospel and see people get baptized and, uh, see people move forward in their spiritual journey, which you do see, but you don't necessarily see it at the same pace that you would like, or that you imagined, or that other people who are say in Africa somewhere or South America are seeing, you just don't see that same pace of people getting baptized and, and things in Japan. So, um, that really gives you a sense of, um, you know, even if you're doing your best and working your hardest. Um, you know, things are different in different places, so you can't uh, be too hard on yourself about that. So uh, it gives you a sense of, of that, as well as uh, just understanding how unique we are as Americans. That is something that really was driven home. I think that being a nation of people who have come from many different places, you know, um, all over Europe and uh, as well as, you know, Africa or whatever, I think we tend to assume that people all around the world are pretty much the same. And that is true in an existential sense. I mean, we all are uh, one blood descended from Adam, and we all are equal before God spiritually. But on the other hand, in a very real day-to-day -day sense, there are major cultural differences between people. And I think sometimes we um, we tend to underplay those or overlook it. But when you're in Japan, you will not underplay that. <laughs> it will be in your face every day. Um, with, for example, Americans tend to be very direct, uh, and we like to get to the point and address the issue. The Japanese tend to be very indirect, and they they value that as kind of a um, an adult characteristic to be indirect and whereas being too blunt is seen as being you're not refined enough and so seeing those things in action every day it makes you realize you know that we are um we're a little bit unique um even compared to the europeans you see a lot of them over there and you and you interact with them and i have a lot of friends over there and you see the differences as well between us and them so it really makes you appreciate our culture and our the uniqueness of our culture um and yeah i mean i think a lot of folks who are doing a lot of complaining here to be very honest we should send them over somewhere <laughs> have them live there for six months or a year uh, and then bring them back and i think a lot of the complaining would go away yeah interesting thing to consider there uh, the collective versus the individual the deference the indirect versus direct uh, all very interesting cultural differences i've had other guests on the show that would talk about uh, how uh, through population migration and sort of uh, evolutionary isolation, large populations have come to just have different psychological characteristics that may uh, make them more predisposed to certain types of, uh, or not predisposed, but 
inclined or better to able to engage with differing uh, political organizations or religious organizations. Uh, and and this difference between collective thinking and, and identity and individual identity is, is a theme that has come up in all kinds of uh, conversations that I've had uh, from, you know, the Catholics here in America to, you know, Alexander Dugan, philosopher from Russia. And how do we reconcile individual ideas with universal ideas? Um, how do you, in your mind, reconcile uh, the sort of the monotheistic, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipowerful God, uh, the Christian God versus like tolerance for people out there with other ideas of God and other ideas of creation in the universe. Is it, is it incumbent upon, uh, Christians to, to, to spread that word and make sure that everybody believes it and takes it to heart? Or is there room for tolerance and, and, and coexistence? Uh, how, how does that work in your experience? Well, um, I know this sounds like a cop out, but I think both are true in the sense that, yeah, I mean, if we believe that God is love and that God sent his son uh, to die for us. And uh, in a few days here, we get to celebrate the nativity uh, where Christ came into the world as one of us. Um, and you want everybody to know that because it is a great journey to go through in life, um, to follow Christ and have him shine a big spotlight on your insides on all the issues that we all have as human beings. And walk with us patiently day by day to help us move in the right direction of reconciliation with our own issues, as well as with relationships with others. And it's a great journey that has sometimes got us ups and downs, but it really, I think, takes us in the direction of loving our fellow human beings and uh, really loving ourselves, not in the sense that our society tells us of doing whatever you want, but of really um, the hard work of unpacking our stuff and understanding who we really are as a person. So that is something you want everybody to experience because it's a good thing. So in that sense, I would say, yes, we do want the word to spread and we want people to, you know, um, you know, follow Christ uh, for sure. On the other hand, you know, this is not something that is done by force. And that's, you know, uh, something that's very important. I think we all kind of understand that. But, you know, it's there's no such thing as forced conversions or there there isn't in the Bible. It's always something that's got to be voluntary that a person wants to embark on themselves. And I think until a person does that, you obviously always show them respect. You show them the love of Christ. Um, Christ was patient with unbelievers, uh, uh, until they came around and, you know, he, he knew that, um, you, we all have, we all sometimes before we follow Christ, I was kind of born uh, and raised in the church, but those who haven't, you know, God is very patient with us until we come around. So I think, yeah, there is absolutely tolerance and, um, uh, patience, respect and love for, you know, people who are outside of, of the faith for sure. I think that's, uh, definitely there. So I think we do have toleration and coexistence. Well, at the same time, wanting people, you know, as much as possible to experience the very good thing that we ourselves experience and that uh, God wants us to experience. So, yeah, I think we want to get the word out. And we also have love and toleration for um, those who are, are not there yet. Yeah, uh, in my I, I appreciate that, John. Thank you. Uh, in, in my life as a sort of public figure, social media guy, I, t I take a lot of crap sometimes. And uh, I've been currently going through a little bit of a firestorm online. And one of the things that stands out the absolute most to me and has been the most moving part of of the last for me, in the last few days is people reaching out to me uh, with love in their heart and a message of redemption and recovery and atonement and just love. And even though I'm surrounded by chaos and darkness and people trying to hurt me and take me down and all these things, the message from the people filled with love that talk to me about Jesus and talk to me about loving thy neighbor and talk to me about redemption, it is just powerful. It just cuts through all the darkness. It cuts through all the chaos and, and the ugliness, and it brings a real sense of truth and beauty and order and love uh, that I think for me personally in this time I'm going through, it's very vague, John, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, it is, is just a sign to me that uh, I'm on the right path and, and, and I truly appreciate the people that have reached out. You can feel it. It's, it's an it's a energy, man. It's incredible. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're having uh, folks encourage you like that. That's a really beautiful thing, and I'm, I'm really glad you're experiencing that. And um, I know it's tough sometimes to go through these situations where you know people want to attack you and all this kind of stuff, but 
yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm very uh, encouraged to hear that you are being encouraged and that you're having folks reach out to you uh, with that. So that's, that's a great thing to hear. Thank you very much. All right, enough about me. Let's get back to you, sir. Uh, I am very interested to understand how you came about to participate in the Trump administration. I would like to know the story behind that. I would like to know where you started. I have here in my notes that you were offered the director of OPM. I don't know if you took that position. Uh, I definitely want to talk about staffing. I want to talk about how do you make effective change in the government. And I definitely want to get to you and Mr. Carson and HUD and housing policy and what it really means for America. So let's start down that path now. How did you come to be involved in the campaign or in the administration? What happened? What was the story there? And uh, let's go from there. Sure. Uh, so when I was in Japan, kind of nearing the end of my time, um, I kind of made this realization, and this is when Obama was president, uh, that if the government's making things worse faster than the good guys are making things better, then we're in a sinking boat. And so I said, let me then look at kind of transitioning my field of service, you know, from missions to uh, governments and public policy. So I, I left Japan and I ended up going to do my master in public administration at Harvard Kennedy School hardcore conservative bastion, as you might imagine. That was a joke for sure. <laughs> right. um, but went over there and, uh, and did my <laughs> master's. And that um, is kind of how I got my feet wet in the government realm. Uh, I learned a lot about stuff in the classes I took, um, as well as people I met. Um, it was really good, good experience. And through that program, uh, I ended up meeting someone who worked for Dr. Carson. And this master's program actually did a little bit later in life uh, than most people do it. The program was kind of for folks who were a little bit older. So I uh, did that in 2015 and 16. So right as I uh, graduated from that, we had the election later that year. And then uh, Dr. Carson was uh, uh, nominated as a head of HUD. So I asked my friend who was working for Dr. Carson, who called me one day, and I said, dude, get me a job. And uh, he got me in and uh, I started in the administration in May of 2017 and was there until the very end. And um, yeah, I started out in a department called Community Planning and Development, which does homelessness grants as well as uh, community kind of economic development grants to states and counties. So I started there as senior advisor. And then I moved up to the secretary's office after a while and worked with uh, uh, Dr. Carson and our uh, team uh, kind of more closely on different initiatives from Dr. Carson as well as the president. And then I was um, uh, appointed by President Trump as uh, acting assistant secretary for community planning and development, which is the place I, I'd started at, at HUD, except this time I was coming in as the leader of it, right as COVID-19 kicked off in March of 2020. Oof, oof. So yeah, that was uh, quite a time to come in. So I had about 700 people uh, that worked for me and we had about an $8 billion budget uh, every year, annual budget. A week later, literally we get this $9 billion COVID money and it's pretty wild because that's more than our annual budget on a one-time appropriation. So all the communities around the country that get our money every year are working full-time just to get that money out. And now you're giving them more than they get an entire year all at once. Um, you have a real capacity problem on whether or not they can even get this money out, whether or not they can even use it because the communities are not even used to getting that much money. So how are they going to use twice as much um, for something that was not even intended for COVID use? This is for homelessness and economic development. So there's a, a question of whether or not this would actually help in the first place, but Congress kind of decided not to answer that question and just do it uh, anyway. And so there's a 5,500 page bill. Um, we get a chunk of it in our nine billion. And so I'm working on making sure we put guardrails on it that you can't use it for, you know, things like Planned Parenthood and illegal immigration and whatnot. And then the congressmen start calling me and literally telling me, asking me what's in the bill. <laughs> I'm like, uh, come again. And they're like, uh, could you tell us what's in this bill? And so, Myself and my staff are literally making PowerPoints for the congressmen to tell them what was in the bill that they signed. So it was really a surreal experience uh, to go through that. Um, but yeah, that was just a great example or a, a not great example of uh, how things work in D.C. Yeah, that's astonishing. Uh, well, no, it is disgusting, but not entirely surprising that the uh, people in Congress voted for and passed legislation that they have no idea what's in there. And I think part of that is by design. Uh, there's no possible way to review all of that information in the time that is given. I think it's partial, partially deliberate. Uh, and it's certainly a symptom of the problem that we have. 
uh, with Congress uh, legislating properly. You know, I, I'm struck by reading some of the early documents uh, around the founding and, and laws and bills passed. The detail involved in those bills was extraordinary back then, like all the way down to like 25 lengths of lumber and six this and four that will be used specifically for this thing by these people at this time with these desired outcomes. And now we get a book, what's 5,500 pages look like, by the way, it's like stacked up off the floor, three feet, and nobody even knows what's in it. I mean, somebody must know what's in there, but not everybody possibly at all. And then it's your job as the executive branch to translate those orders from the legislation from Congress into action and activity and results. And like, it's... <laughs> I worked in education for a long time. So like, I know what it's like to get the federal money and then to have to do all the requirements and whatnot. And you do all the requirements, but none of it is really checking to see if it actually worked. It's like, did you do this thing? Did you hire this kind of guy? Did you have this check-in process? Did you have this annual review, et cetera? Um, and, and man, I gotta tell you, that doesn't sound like that much money for given what you guys were doing. What were, what were some of your policy goals and, and were you able to have success with them? What was your, what are your takeaways from that experience? What are you proud of? What do you, what do you regret? Well, um, one of the uh, uh, programs under our, my purview was uh, our, the nation's biggest homelessness program at the federal level. Um, it was about $2 billion, a little bit more than $2 billion a year. Uh, so what had happened under the Obama administration is they were trying to transform homelessness aid so that you simply give people free housing indefinitely. Um, there's no requirements for substance abuse uh, treatment, mental health, spiritual direction, uh, workforce training, anything like that. Um, you can't require that. You just have to give them uh, free housing indefinitely. And that's the direction they wanted to go. A little bit of a problem there is it doesn't quite work. Um, you actually need to deal with the real issue of that's going on inside of that person's heart in order to um, get them better. And that requires having some kind of requirement such as you know, counseling, uh, mental health, you know, the things I just mentioned. So when we tried to go and put those things back in, it was like you're trying to kill puppies and kittens or something. Um, they just come out of you saying, oh, man, how could you be so heartless? Uh, how could dare you put requirements on them? Oh, that's so mean. And so it was a really big fight to actually get things moved in the direction of um, because we care about people and we actually want the person to improve and get better as a human being. We don't just want to keep them hooked on the government forever. Um, with the government paying their rent for the next, you know, 15 years. Um, apparently that's, that's, uh, you know, you're being a monster if you want that. So that was one of the biggest fights. And, you know, that was not necessarily a happy ending because they ended up putting language in the appropriation uh, that we couldn't change the requirements, which is the first time they've ever done that as far as we know. Um, and it shows you uh, on the one hand, they were under threat, which is good. This, what I call the poverty industrial complex. They really saw us as a threat uh, uh, and they had to go and do these great lengths to stop what we were doing. Um, but, you know, they were able to get some of the Republicans even to drink the Kool-Aid on this. So that was an example of something that we fought. But now the fight is continuing. There are folks working with the Congress to get this stuff changed. So it's uh, continuing in a different realm over in the legislative branch. But uh, we're glad to be part of uh, the momentum on that. So that is that is a big issue that we uh, that we looked at. Um, another one along similar lines is, um, you might be familiar with the section eight program, mm -hmm. which is where you can get a voucher every month to, which pays your rent. Basically you pay only a very small amount or nothing. And the federal government will pick up the tab on your rent if you make less than a certain amount. And we wanted to have work requirements so that if you're, if you're an able-bodied adult, in other words, if you're not elderly or disabled, but you're an able-bodied adult capable of work, then you have to work in order to get the free rent. Um, that's another thing where, you know, they think you're trying to kill puppies and kittens if you want people to have to do some work um, uh, to get their free rent because, you know, we care about people. We want the person to have the dignity of getting money in their pocket every two weeks and realize how that really um, develops them as a human being, give them some self-sufficiency and move them up. Um, that's what we want to do. We're not just about keeping people hooked. But even that is uh, it was like pulling teeth to be able to get that through. So there's just so much momentum in the system uh, to keep it the way it is. And uh, the poverty industrial complex has got their hooks and uh, many of the lawmakers and the news media, and they've got many advocacy organizations. Uh, but that is also a fight that is continuing um, in other fronts uh, with uh, the legislative uh, branch. And, you know, God willing, if uh, I get in there and many good folks get in there in November of 22, we can start to tackle these at the legislative level. 
um, and kind of uh, go around some of the entrenched momentum there. So uh, those are just a couple of the, of the fronts that we uh, looked at that we're seeing some fruit on now. We're seeing su success on as the work continues um, uh, now. But yeah, it's uh, it, it takes a lot. I think this is why the left was so freaked out in 2020. I think they realized what was going to happen if Trump got in there again. Um, and this is when you saw the mass mail-in ballots and, and things. Right. We were getting our bearings and things uh, quite extensively uh, uh, as time went on. So, but yeah, that those are just uh, some examples of the kind of uh, uh, fights there are. What an interesting story you're telling me there. Uh, I, I recently was a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute, and we did an extensive deep dive into uh, the founding documents, uh, the contemporaneous state constitutions, and the letters of the founders, and the the political philosophy and the moral conditions required for freedom and such. And the, the founders were very, very clear that government had a role in encouraging moral and virtuous behavior because the yes. Republic as they created it could not exist without a moral and virtuous people. And yes. I, I, I think about that. I think about, I believe is Aristotle that basically says that, that life is activity, like activity and action is life. I've I've been known to say that you know God created the world the creation the creation is the vibe of the universe right like if you build and create if you do things if you grow you will align yourself to the energy of the universe and then when you take all those big ideas and then you then you look at them on a very concrete specific policy level and, and you see the difference between seeing someone in crisis and just handing them stuff thinking that that is going to make a difference. Whereas the alternative view is to help them become and encourage them to become more moral and virtuous and more aligned to the energy of the universe, more aligned to action is life. Uh, be, and you know, mood follows movement too, right? So all these things that you can encourage are positive benefits to people. Um, is there, and have you, have you, you feel this, this is a, this is meta. This is really big struggle, uh, be between how do you help somebody? You just give them stuff or you encourage them to be a better person. What role? I, I think we know the answer here, but I'd like to hear you just explain a little bit more. What, what role does the federal government in particular play in creating moral and virtuous people? And what is its responsibility in that dynamic in the sense that if you're just giving people stuff, you know, maybe you're, you're actually hurting them spiritually. Yes. I think there's a very good point there. Uh, it seems like a lot of folks have accepted the idea that throwing money at a problem is how you solve the problem. Uh, when in most cases that is not at all true. So I think we, because of the education system, which is controlled by folks who have that ideology, um, that's what we get indoctrinated in going through the education system. And so a lot of people just take it for granted that if you want to solve a problem like homelessness, just give more money to it. Well, homelessness spending has increased by something like two or three fold over the past uh, 10 years, but yet the problem is getting worse. And so it's just one example of where spending more money hasn't solved the problem. Uh, same with uh, black home ownership. You know, there's a lot of talk about the black home ownership rate is much lower than other groups. Well, it's about the same today as it was in the 60s even though there's been trillions of dollars in spending on various programs and various housing programs and whatnot, it really hasn't gone up. And so there's something really missing there. And it is difficult for the politicians to wrap their head around this because they think they'll get attacked for being not compassionate or they cut spending on these. When in fact it is compassionate because you're actually moving towards something that works. And so that's part of the dilemma here is that even among many Republicans, um, they don't want to be seen as a guy that cuts something because the optics look bad even if what they're doing actually will end up helping more people. Um, you know, here's a good example. You take the Section 8 rent vouchers, right? You give out tons of these vouchers um, every year. And what that does is it drives up demand because there are now more people who can afford to rent. So that increases your demand. Well, when you increase demand, you also increase prices if the supply stays the same. So now you're increasing prices at the low end of the rental market. And all those poor people who don't have a voucher are now paying more for rent because of the Section 8 vouchers that are going out. And if you add up the total value of the extra money they're paying, it actually is a greater loss than the benefit from the people getting the vouchers. Mm. So this is just one example of how this program, which many people assume helps, actually has really serious unintended consequences and actually hurts more poor people than it helps. 
and you go through program after program and you see a similar dynamic of where if you just look at the basic math and the science uh, there, it just, uh, there's not a lot of evidence that these work at the very best or at the worst case, they actually hurt people. So yeah, I think what you're saying is exactly right. But the problem is um, if you're a lobbyist group or if you're the poverty industrial complex, they're building homelessness housing in California for sometimes 600 grand per unit for homelessness housing. And you better believe that some of the developers, underwriters, syndicators, lawyers, the middlemen are getting a cut. And they're the ones who will often advocate for more homelessness spending. Oh, how dare you, heartless person? How could you not want more spending for the homeless? Oh, you call yourself a Christian? So you increase the spending and then you get the $600,000 per unit homelessness housing where some folks are making out on like bandits on it. So that is kind of where we're at right now. And uh, you're right. It's not producing virtue. It's not helping the people that it's intending to help, but it's helping somebody. Um, and as long as they have this message of, I'm compassionate, I care about people. That's why we have to increase spending. As long as people are willing to buy that, uh, it makes it easy for them to keep doing that. Indeed, uh, I worked for many years in real estate development. I've done all kinds of stuff. I've done urban infill, I've done rehabs, multifamily, condo, commercial interiors. I've done greenfield development in the suburbs, delivering lots to builders and such. And I know I, as soon as you said $600,000 units, I know where all the cuts are going. You've got a, a development fee. You've got a construction management fee. You've got a project management fee. Then you've got your regulatory fee, you know, the people that handle all the regulations around it. Then you've got all the lawyers for every single one of those people involved on everything, then all the way down. And I know that the tradesmen are doing good there, but you know, they have funny way of doing contracts as well you know it's not the carpenter that's making out it's the guy that hires the carpenters who bids on the jobs who's got the guy in his company uh who is there as a token to get the minority uh element of the low income housing requirements and man it is a flipping scam it is a flipping scam yeah. and the market itself would be able to deliver a adequately constructed and priced unit if and only we would let the market do its thing. It's one of these, it goes along with one of these uh, contradictory notions people have, which is that if you put a, uh, a ceiling on rent, that you're going to make things better for everybody. But when you, when you rent, when you cap rents, you decrease supply, decrease quality, and you have people struggling to find housing uh, at all. So what this says to me is that we need to begin to, we need to simplify. And man, oof, the complexity that we've created in this society is just a ticking time bomb uh, that we're seeing exploding actually all over the place. And there's even more reservoirs of this complexity that's going to just explode. Um, but as a congressman, and man, I have so many things I also want to get back to here on real estate. But uh, as a congressman, how how would you propose simplifying things and stripping out some of this complexity that's leading to these negative or unexpected, maybe even expected, but let's say suboptimal outcomes? How how do we make it easier to collect the money from the people, centralize it to the government, and send it back out? Maybe that's a problem in and of itself. What, what do you think, John? Well, I think um, cutting red tape is a, a, a thing we've got to do. For example, I remember at HUD, I'll never forget, we had a, a gentleman come in who uh, builds homelessness housing, and he could build it actually for a really low cost. And these are pretty decent units you could put folks in, and you could have the services for them, you know, job training, uh, mental health, et cetera. And he was doing it for much lower than people getting government subsidies. And so the problem is if he was going to apply for a government grant, like from HUD, for example, the red tape was so huge that it would cost like three times more to do the unit because you got to have a certain type of lighting, a certain type of insulation, you got to have a certain number of parking spaces, a certain thickness of the walls, and you got to have uh, no more than X number of people per room and, you know, you get all these this red tape in there and it ends up becoming uh, cost prohibitive. And so I think we've really got to look at reducing the red tape uh, for uh, what it takes to get money for some of these programs now you don't want them using it on things like planned parenthood so you got to have some level of guardrails to make sure the money is being used on what it's supposed to be used for but when it comes to a lot of the um the requirements on there again it comes to a situation where if uh you know if you got to use the most expensive type of light bulb um you know that's going to drive up the cost when you don't even you might not even need that um if you're dealing with um you know um, poorer populations you want them to have a place that is decent and livable but it's not going to be the Hilton. Uh, it's just got to be a place that's livable while they move their way up uh, and uh, in society. So 
But I think there is a mentality that everywhere has got to be the Hilton. And so that ends up really skewing things. So we can really reduce some of the red tape, uh, make it easier to build uh, good quality stuff, which look, the American people are very innovative. I have no doubt whatsoever. You get a bunch of guys together from around the country and say, let's build some housing for the homeless. That is good stuff. And that is cheap. You will get answers. We've got people that are so creative when it comes to building stuff. I have total faith in the people, but if we can get the red tape out of there so we can just empower that innovation that's out there in our culture. I think that's, that's the thing you got to tackle. It's just the, the bureaucratic uh, red tape stuff. Yeah. Making it simpler for people to respond to the marketplace and deliver uh, on the demand, no matter where it is in the pricing spectrum. And uh, one thing that people don't understand about real estate supply is they they look and they see uh, in, in Washington, D.C., for example, there's just thousands of, of uh, class A units coming online all the time. And they're like, why are you just building all these apartments for rich people? And what folks who criticize that don't understand is that the more of that that you can build, it actually opens up the lower end of the market for people to pay a lower price. All additional supply, if everything is is equal, reduces the price. So even if it's a luxury penthouse, even if it's three bedrooms that no one else can afford, it still is going to filter down because you won't have people competing for the same units. Now, I want to ask you a question about something that has a bit of my personal history and is totally relevant to this is I, I'm originally from Chicago. In Chicago, they used to have these towers called Cabrini Green. I think it was Robert Taylor yep. Homes. And it was, you yep. would drive by them going into the city, man. And it was just tower after tower after tower after tower of concentrated poverty, sort of section eight in theory, or I'm not sure what it was exactly, but low income housing you know, provided by the state or the city or the county there. They tore all those down. And instead of having the towers, then those same folks who were residing there were then spread out around the city using vouchers and such. And people will tie the crime explosion in Chicago to this dispersion of the low income housing across the city. Do you have any opinions or ideas on that? And the main, the main theme here is sort of concentrated versus widespread, like built and constructed in towers for people to come live in or give people vouchers to go find out where whoever they are going to make it work. What, what, what's your take on that? I do recall reading some studies that that effect you mentioned is, in fact, real. Um, I don't remember the degree, but yeah, I mean, it, it's the same problem we're talking about. If you have a person who is uh, troubled um, and they may, you know, uh, have some criminal activity in their family or themselves, simply taking that person and moving them from point A to point B is not going to solve the problem. Um, I think a lot of people in the government tend to think that's the case, but um, you've got to actually deal with a person. Just like what we were talking about with homelessness, there's a similar analog here where we're not actually dealing with the issues going on with the inside the person. And so um, they're trying to do the social engineering where you, okay, tear down the big gigantic public housing, you know, the Robert Taylor and the Cabrini Green and spread, spread the folks out. But if you haven't dealt with the issue, you just have the same problem spread out now. Um, and if you want to look at real solutions here, and this is what the science says, and that's also what the Bible happens to say, imagine that families, 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 mm. kids raised in a married two parent family, um, have, I forgot the number, something a dramatically lower time, five or seven times lower chance of becoming poor, of engaging in criminal activity than those raised and other arrangements. So you would think if the government was really thinking smart about this, they'd be saying, how do we get more families among poor people? Because the number one way out of poverty is to have strong families. If you've got a mom and a dad, they're married, and the kid has grown up in that environment. Um, overwhelming chances are, uh, after a generation, they're not going to be poor anymore if that kid was brought up right. And we know this is true because if you look at the generations of many folks that have come to this country, um, they came dirt poor with just the clothes on their backs. And now many folks have become very successful because they had strong families and uh, folks worked their way up. And that's true of every racial background. It doesn't matter what kind of background you come from. But it seems like the government is doing the opposite. For example, if you're poor and you're on benefits, if you get married and you add the extra income, you now go above the threshold and you don't get any benefits anymore. Therefore, you don't get married because you'll lose your benefits. So we're literally incentivizing people against the one best thing we know that reduces poverty. This is one of the hugest ways we're shooting ourselves in the foot. You see a similar dynamic with, um, you know, if, uh, a, a woman, for example, chooses to have children without the father from the get go. Um, we give more benefits based on the number of children. Um, so you're actually now subsidizing and paying for a family structure that is harmful to children. 
And that is not that we hate anybody or against someone. We love everybody, but especially we love children. And so we want those children to be raised in an environment that's healthiest for them. And that is with mom and the dad. So why are we then subsidizing and paying for a family structure that is not optimal for kids? But we do that. I think if you could address those issues, I think that would kind of, I don't want to say automatically, that may be a bit strong way of saying it, but it would take care of a lot of the problems we're seeing with what happened with Cabrini Green and spreading folks out. Because if you have a healthy family, it doesn't matter where you live at, you're going to have the right values. And, you know, I look at my parents who are raised in the deep south in Alabama. Um, my grandfather died early. So my grandmother, you know, was there and she was tough as nails. If she found out there was a man in the family, even the extended family not working, she'll hunt you down and she'll say, why aren't you at work? And she'll make sure that you get out and do what's right. Um, I think there was a time when we have those kind of values um, among all communities in our country, but things have become quite skewed. And so they're trying to add these government programs and we'll make this housing here and we'll make this house type of housing and we'll put them all in there and that's going to give them opportunity. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. You do want people to have opportunity, but you got to deal with an issue at the heart of the matter and deal with the real person and the issues or else whatever you give them is not going to amount to anything. And sadly, what you described in Chicago is, is a good example of that. Yeah, I, I worked for, I've had some, so many different careers, first private equity and hedge fund, then real estate development. Then I worked 10 years in charter schools. I was executive director of charter schools in DC. I was a turnaround expert. I was hired to turn around the worst performing schools in the district of Columbia. And I, and I did it. I was successful until they ran me out of town for being a white guy. Now, uh, oh, wow. on, on our board, uh, at one of our schools, we had this, this older gentleman and the rest of the board members sort of tolerated him, but he would go on on these rants, but they were, they were educated rants. He was so right. He would say, look, every, he was a, uh, not that it really matters, but he was African American and he was an engineer. And so he just kept saying over and over again, this is a systems problem. This is a systems mm -hmm. problem. When he's talking about behavioral issues in the school, when he's talking about reading and, and, and math scores within the school, when he's talking about any issue going on in the school, he's, he's like, this is a systems problem. And that is to me where I began to really zoom out and try to understand how it was that there were people in this community that we were serving where there was a single mom with multiple children from multiple different dads, unmarried, on benefit. We were 99%, 99% free and reduced lunch, probably 100%. Uh, and I mean, so this is like the deepest, darkest, not darkest, the, the, the most stricken neighborhoods uh, of Washington, DC. And I saw firsthand the incentive structure at play that you're describing where uh, it disincentivizes marriage. It incentivizes having children without a dad. And you end up then with a mom who's overwhelmed and unable to effectively parent, much less improve her own life, much less continue on with advanced education, continuing education, professional development, et cetera. And it, it made me wonder, and I've been asking this question in so many different circumstances, is this a, 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 a failure of ignorance in terms of the policymaking or is it a deliberate destruction of a community? Do the Democrats want black folks in the city to be single parents struggling and on the dole, unable to rise up and to do the American thing of changing your station? Or is it just an accident because they want to help? What do you think? Is it dumb or diabolical? Uh, yeah, that's a trick one. I think it's probably a combination of both. Um, I think if, if someone is a statist and they believe that the government is going to solve all your problems, as many leftists do, then it is to their advantage to have as many people on benefits as possible, uh, because now you have uh, more people that uh, need you uh, and to, to, to live. So you're expanding the footprint of the government and people's dependence on the government. So, yeah, I do think in that sense, there is a certain deliberateness to this. Um, but I think on a large scale, when you, you know, when we look at why haven't we been able to change this, even when Republicans have the majority, there's very little action on entitlement reform, on welfare reform. Uh, recently, at least, um, you know, post 2000. Um, I think one reason is because a lot of people simply assume, you know, if you're giving out money to help the poor people, that means you're helping them. It's a very simple belief that people have, which is not true at all. Um, and so people have a hard time fathoming how this really works. 
And then when you say maybe we shouldn't actually be paying, um, you know, a, a single uh, parents to have more kids without the father, for example, people think you're being mean. And so it's not true. You're actually helping the system. As you said, it's a systems problem. I like that a lot. Um, that, that's a really accurate way of describing it. Uh, but people don't necessarily think that way. They take it kind of uh, a one dimensional on the surface. How could you take money away from you know, this person? Are you mean? Do you hate? Are you saying you're better than someone? You know, people go through that thought process. So there hasn't been good messaging and a good strategy, I think, from uh, I don't mean you and me, but generally people on our side um, uh, to counter this and say, look, if you really love people, if you really care about people, if you care about children, you want children to be raised in the best environment. That's what you do if you love uh, kids. Therefore, then you'll look at what the science and the common sense and and Christianity and, and Judaism, every you know good religion tells us that you need two parents at home. Um, this is just you know common sense. What well, used to be common sense, um, and I think that message has got to get out there. You know, we need um, strong families, but it's not getting there. So the politicians are not having the courage to step up and do it. So they're leaving these programs the same. Um, I think it's going to take uh, guts, and I think we're getting there. I mean, if we see a wave in 22, we may have some folks who are able to stand up and say, look, we're not going to tolerate the destruction of children and families anymore. Thomas Sowell used to always say, slavery, civil war, segregation, Jim Crow did not destroy the black family, but the welfare state did. And I think that's a very good thing to keep in mind as we um, see this this madness going on. But another data point. I, I like to look at like the, the data over time, especially you look at the black home ownership rate. It had its fastest increase from 1880 to 1930. There's no HUD. There's no welfare state, no government programs. It was regular people in families and communities building their own houses. Back then you could even order a house from a Sears catalog. Yeah. Um, but it was, they didn't have regulatory red tape and all the stuff that we have today. You could easily build your own house and the home ownership rate increased by about three to four fold over that period whereas it's never increased that fast since then even with all the spending 22 23 trillion and in, in, uh, so-called anti-poverty spending since the 60s you've never seen results like that so i think we really have got to dispense with this idea that more spending is how you help the poor and the vulnerable and it's going to take a, a huge um effort i think we need to get every conservative filmmaker and a marketing person together and have a big powwow and lock themselves in the room and with pizza and no one comes out until we figure out how do you message this to people psychologically and uh, get it out there that, you know, we love people and if you love people, we're not just throwing money at them. We want to actually get people um, up and out. So I think it's going to take something like that. Then once the public awareness and the pitchforks come out, the politicians are going to have to know they got to change this thing or they're not going to get elected. Um, no. So yeah, I think that's what it would take. It, uh, you mentioned the Sears houses uh, it, where I used to live in Washington, D.C., in the Palisades area. It, it's all of them. There, there's so many of these Sears catalog houses. Uh, really fascinating to think about it. It's not quite the same. Uh, man, so many issues there. I, I want to talk. You talked about the black, the rate of black home ownership and the way that it increased and then sort of stopped. Uh, I've seen the same evidence in closing the achievement gap as well. Uh, there was a, a big closure and then the closing stopped, uh, coinciding with actually focusing on the achievement gap and throwing all this money at it and making it the issue that seemed to be, uh, correlate, you know, slightly with when the gap stopped closing. And, you know, as somebody who was involved in real estate and fixed income around 2006, seven, eight, and nine, I very, very uh, vividly lived the housing experience from the housing crisis experience from, from all levels. I understand the mortgage-backed security market from my hedge fund private equity days, so I knew what was going on there, the craziness there. And then I was also building, delivering, and selling housing units in the city at the same time. So I saw people coming to the closing table with... 0% down, first trust, second trust, a third trust, going over 100% LTV, actually walking away from the table with cash, with no income and no assets. And in my mind, this was the most extreme credit expansion you've ever seen. And yet today people will tell us, and this ended up being the source of the housing crisis, right? Uh, well, and the separation between the lender's risk and the default risk, that was a big deal. Uh, but yep. people will say today that access to credit and access to the ability to purchase homes is the limiting systemic racism factor 
that is keeping people from actually achieving home ownership. What do you what do you say to people like that when I feel like we've already lived through like that trial and it didn't quite work out? What what do you say to people in terms of credit access and and such and the systemic racism argument around there? You know, I, I love science, but I mean real science, not what certain people um, that claim is, is science. I mean, like real studies. And the data shows that that, that argument is simply false, that um, access to credit is number one barrier. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ed Pinto over at AEI. Um, he's a housing researcher. Um, he's He does spectacular work on this. He goes through all the numbers and crunches them. And he actually has shown over the past uh, several months that this argument that uh, access to credit is the the uh, culprit here is not true. When you adjust for credit scores and socioeconomic background, there actually is not really a gap between black and white, for example, and access to mortgages. Um, so what you really have to look at is why are the credit scores lower for some groups? And this goes back to, again, the very same thing that we uh, see coming up over and over again. You gotta get to the heart of the person, the mind of the person, and you gotta deal with things like delayed gratification, savings, the nature of interest, um, what happens to a dollar if you put it in today and you've got an interest rate and where's that in a year and two years? Um, do you want to buy your expensive shoes or do you want to put that money in and see where it goes in a CD or put it in a uh, index fund or um, that kind of thing? That knowledge of this this investment, the late gratification, time value of money, you've got to get that um, just soaked in and marinated uh, with uh, disadvantaged populations. That's going to be the key to this. And that's how you're going to see people get their credit scores up, understand money better. And then that's going to get people where they can pay their mortgage on time because they've had that uh, built into them once we get those things um, ingrained in the population. But, you know, the reason I think you don't see a lot of action there is it takes time and it's hard. There's no simple government program you can sign off on that will get this solved within two years of a, of a congressional election cycle. Um, this is something that takes a while and I'm OK with that. I think all real solutions to these difficult problems will take time. But uh, because of the nature of political cycles and how short they are, a lot of the politicians don't want to uh, take a, a stab at something that is going to take a, a long time or longer than their election cycles to, to solve. So, yeah, I mean, the real way to do this is just the same as everything else is get to the heart of the matter, um, love folks and uh, get people to understand the uh, what money means and savings and investment. Then you get the scores up and you reduce the disparity. Another thing here is married uh, married couples compared to single couples have something like twice the rate of home ownership. And because of the dramatic increase in um, unwed mothers among uh, the black population, the percentage of black people who are married has just dropped since the 60s. And it's because people that are married are more likely to own homes, that therefore means the percentage of people that own homes has also dropped. Yeah. So I think that the majority, not the entirety, but the majority of this problem can simply be attributed to the uh, dramatic decline in marriage among the black population. And uh, the politicians often don't want to talk about this. They don't want to look at that because, again, it's a little bit of a harder problem. We can crack it. We know what it would take. Uh, you got to have the economic incentives in place uh, for marriage. But um, that is something that a lot of them don't want to talk about. So they want to do surface solutions, band-aid solutions. Um, you have this critical race theory type uh, racism is what it is, to be very blunt about it. Um, that is popping up. And they're, now they're trying to apply that explanation to the mortgages and housing saying, oh, we can just explain this with one word, racism. That's all it takes. Uh, and yeah, that's why we're seeing all these problems. It's not scientific. It's um, it's almost a conspiracy theory in a certain manner of the word because it's not based on real uh, research and randomized controlled trials and actual real science. It's, it's an unproven and unprovable um, explanation for any problem that they want to apply it to. But if we look at the real data, I think we know what it takes to uplift folks. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's how folks view money, how folks use money. That's where it's at. I'm all with you on trying to encourage higher rates of marriage and uh, family formation. I think that's essential. Uh, what sort of economic incentive or policy program do you think would create an environment that would encourage more people to get married? What, what, would, what would it take? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is remove the rewards for not being married. And so the first thing would be we've got to deal with this issue of if you get married, your combined income goes over the threshold so you don't get your benefits anymore. Somehow or another, we've got to make it so um, you, there's not that hit um, on, on folks when they get married. So I don't know if that means that you you have a grace period or you get to keep it for a little bit, then it goes away or 
um, whatever the solution is. But that's something that's got to be thought about. Um, the second thing is, um, as you mentioned, and as I've, uh, you know, I've actually seen directly from uh, friends and family of, of uh, cases where a person uh, uh, would, would literally say, unfortunately, a poor person, if I have another uh, kid, I'll get an extra $600 a month. Um, so it's a very sad thing to see that. So I think we've got to make it so we stop doing that. Um, uh, not because we hate anybody or because we're blaming anyone or because we're being judgmental, but because we want the kids to be raised in uh, the, the safest and healthiest environment for them. The chances of child abuse, uh, single parent versus two married parents is something like uh, 10 times higher and physical abuse is something like 20 times higher. Dramatic differences. We're literally paying for child abuse situations by doing this. So I think we've got to stop paying um, uh, for uh, families that are dangerous for children. And those, those two things alone will go a long way. Then once you stop disincentivizing it, I think we can look at ways to incentivize it. Almost something like, I don't know, um, a tax credit for poor people who get married or something along those lines. Um, I need to look at the numbers for that to see you know, what the cost comes out to. But I, I, I'm pretty sure the economic benefits, the education benefits, the lowered crime rate you would get would be so substantial that it would be way more than any cost to do that tax credit. So I think you would save taxpayer money over time uh, by um, uh, paying a little upfront to incentivize marriage among poor people. So I think that that's something you look at. There's also, um, and I think this has been tried in a few places, but something like uh, LIFT is an acronym. I think it stands for Low Income First Time Home Buyer. Hmm. Uh, right now we give out all these rent vouchers, pay a rent, but why not do something to help people buy something? So if you're a married family and you are, are poor, why not do something perhaps to help people uh, with a different type of mortgage? Um, uh, 15 years uh, mortgages tend to be good because they end up paying less interest over time. If you can arrange it right and get the payment down, I think there are ways you can help people get wealth creation uh, for for uh, folks that way. So I think there's lots of solutions like that we can look at um, if there's a political willpower. And I think, frankly, if Republicans win big time in 22 and uh, Sleepy Joe um, you know, uh, goes and plays with Legos after 2024, the pressure is going to be on to not do things the way we've been doing it before. And I think everything we're talking about now has got to be on the table. And I hope that every American who voted and every American, you know, who's sick of this stuff just stands up and just shouts at their representative coast to coast saying, look, you got to love families. we got to cut this garbage out and do something that actually helps children and helps the poor. We don't want you just fi financing this poverty industrial complex anymore. I think people have got to stand up and yell it. Um, if we get in there, because when if there is a win, that's what people are expecting. The results have got to be there, too. They just can't got, get in there and keep doing the same thing as before. So I think this is going to give a huge opportunity for new things uh, that uh, many of the Republican leaderships always talk about, but never done. And I think, um, if God willing, if I get in there, I'll, I want to be part of that wave that causes a ruckus and tries to get us to do some of this stuff. Indeed. Uh, I, in my studies, I've, I've learned that there's four levels of morality uh, in there's uh, your uh, divine revelation, the natural law, then civil and moral law, civic law, and then the law of fashion and opinion. And it is, we, you know, the divine law and natural law certainly uh, lead us towards marriage and uh, coupling and family. Uh, we need the civic uh, law to do the same thing. And we can take, we can help that by taking away the incentive incentives towards single, fa you know, single momhood and whatnot, and add in incentives towards family. But the law of opinion and fashion also must change. And we're seeing, I believe today, just a tidal wave of cultural, you know, stories and artifacts and movies and, and ideas and themes that, that discourage family creation, that discourage marriage, that discourage making a commitment and working towards something that's bigger than you for a cause that's bigger than you for a calling that's bigger than you. And it brings me back to the original, one of the original things we were talking about is the individualism versus collectivism. There's a, there's a collective, a collectivist notion here in that I think it's important for people to get married and have families because it's good for families. It's also good for your community, which means it's good for your nation. So in a sense, your individualistic behavior there has to be tuned in to the group outcomes. I used to think that in my individual behavior, as long as I wasn't like very obviously hurting somebody, that it was okay. Everything would be just fine. And I've learned over time that that's not actually accurate. 
uh, even our individual decisions that we make in the privacy of our own home end up having societal impact. Um, how do we change this, uh, the law of fashion or opinion uh, to move us towards you know, it being cool? <laughs> it being cool and productive and the right thing to do, even if it might be hard sometimes, or even if you have to might make a, make a sacrifice sometimes and maybe tie it together with the individual versus collective. I don't know. Just what, what, what do you think about making the law of opinion swing in this way? Yeah. I mean, I think you've really got a good point there. And, and this is why Andrew Breitbart would always say politics is downstream from culture. And then I think you might argue that culture is downstream from religion. Uh, but I think that there is a huge uh, fight to be had at the cultural level. And I think that folks of our persuasion are pretty outnumbered there uh, when you look at Hollywood production, TV shows, music, um, and you look at K-12 education, higher education, there is an indoctrination. Uh, and some sometimes it's low grade and it's not easy to realize, but um, I, I do think just as you said, people are indoctrinated into a, um, a immediate gratification, self gratification, um, where I can do what I want. And as long as it's not, you know, bothering anyone else, there's no negative impact, but we know that's not true. So, yeah, I mean, I think that there are lots of battles to be fought on the cultural level of, uh, music makers, filmmakers, um, uh, people in the education system to, uh, stand up and. Uh, really innovate and uh, produce content that assures our point of view. Uh, I, I think that I have to look at the data, but conservative movies and movies with, with um, those kind of themes, I think do well um, often. And I think we just need to get some more of them out there um, that, that have the themes that we're talking about. So yeah, I mean, this the, the cultural hegemon that the, the left uh, embodies is, is significant and it captures a lot of people. Even a kid raised in a, a good home and goes to church on Sunday, when they're out there being indoctrinated uh, in school every day and, and the music and the movies, that might be enough to overturn everything they're learning in the home and at church on Sunday because it's just uh, it's gotten to that level. So I think there's going to have to be a game plan and a strategy for how do you actually uh, take back and start influencing those institutions. Uh, and then you'll start to get uh, people aligned. And then as that builds up, you start to get pressure on the politicians to change the economics of it. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a cultural fight to be had there that requires cultural strategy and that requires funding. I think the left is very smart in understanding that they need to finance long-term solutions that do not produce immediate return. I think that on our side, we don't have that sense as much. Um, I think that our very wealthy people um, do not necessarily sometimes have the same vision that the wealthy folks on the left have of uh, being willing to finance things that will not produce an immediate return but in 10 years or 12 years is going to get you um, a, a big a benefit. So I think we're going to have to see a, a revolution in thinking among uh, that part of our side as well. Indeed, which is why somebody like Amanda Milius out there, I want to encourage you, Amanda, yes. keep going, keep going. I know they've got a lot of projects in the works and, you know, I, I'm, I'm in this particular space, this conservative media space. So I do see, signs of activity. I do see signs of people putting yep. out great work. Uh, there's been great movies. Mike Cernovich has put out some good movies. Amanda's put out some good yep. movies. Uh, there are other yep. folks working in this field too, that are doing good stuff that uh, I forgot to have mentioned perhaps just now. I mean, we're even trying it our best with uh, children's comics. We've created a children's comic called Lil Chad. And it is, if you read it, it's so anodyne. It, it reminds me of Family Circus. And uh, if you remember that from the, the papers years ago, I would always read those Family Circus and just be like, why, why are these even in here? This is, this is not even funny. But now I totally understand, man. It was about spreading these values and these ideas and these concepts yeah. in a way that children can understand and absorb. And so Lil Chad is our effort. It's not, I had, I didn't create it. I just helped distribute it. Uh, it is, a, a, our, one of our small ways that we're working towards, uh, putting out content that will help shape kids perceptions of values and morality and family. Uh, I know that Ashley St. Clair has been working hard to put together a, a series of children's books. I know uh, Jack Posobiec, I think, participated in that as well, too. So I'm really happy to say that I can yep. see I can see the activity coming that we need. Now, uh, inside the Liminal yep. Order, we've got guys working on also an anime 
coming up that's going to be uh, right. anime cartoons ones that are designed to scroll on your phone i've never seen this before where like the the message bubbles are in different ways it's it's native to mobile scrolling we've got animation stuff coming out we really want to push the values this is our cultural project the liminal order to push uh the cultural values that we see as important in the world which would be for us so all men's groups would be masculinity brotherhood and sovereignty and we want to see these values be promoted um I have some hope there. I have some hope there. I, w- I want yeah. to. Yeah, all the people you mentioned are great. I've, I've heard of most of them. And yeah, that's that's excellent. We do have great folks that are doing good work, like Amanda, especially, and, and all the others. So yeah. yeah, that's encouraging to be reminded of. Yeah, it, it really is. Now, I want to ask you one more question about your housing and, and urban development experience. What was it like working with Dr. Carson? Because I got to say, from an outsider looking in, the media did a really good job of portraying him in a negative light. Um, almost never even taking him seriously in any capacity whatsoever. When the guy is an extraordinarily accomplished and brilliant man who uh, it seemed by all my perception seemed to be absolutely genuine and sincere and authentic in his care and concern for America and the American people. Um, what was it like working with him? What did you observe of the ecosystem that was around him? Uh, were people working to help him? Were people working to hurt him? Um, you know, please give us some insight into that because I think the people really should, should learn more about Dr. Carson. Yeah, you know, it was great working under Dr. Carson because he's got the right values. I mean, he's got basic American values like we have, and he understands that you can't just throw money at a problem, but you've got to actually help the person. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's refreshing and it's good to have that kind of perspective in your leadership. So uh, that was a very positive thing. Um, he's cool under pressure. I mean, they just threw all kinds of vile attacks at him in the media uh, constantly. And it was just absolutely insane. Um, so he just, uh, he maintained his composure in that kind of atmosphere. So that's something to, to really admire and something for me to remember as well as I embark on this journey um, of running for Congress. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a great, uh, thing to learn from. Um, I think, you know, overall, uh, in our administration, we had folks that are aligned with the presidents and with his, uh, uh, president Trump and his reform agenda. And you had some people who were not, um, and that was true all across the administration. So, um, yes, uh, you know, we sometimes had our, our internal, um, discussions with, uh, folks of different persuasions, uh, you know, and we just, I, I was on the side of always trying to push for what the president wanted, which is, uh, which is what is right and trying to move things forward and, uh, look at root causes and, and lift people up. Uh, but, um, as we saw in the news constantly during our administration, not all appointees had that same perspective and agenda. Um, and that was true. Um, you know, I think across agencies, some, some more so than others. Uh, so yeah, that is, that is something that we experienced at times. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it was one of the things you had to work around. I mean, we, we know that when you go to D.C., I think many of us understand that the uh, what some people call the deep states or, you know, the career embedded uh, workforce. Um, uh, you know, many of my employees were, were fine. You know, they do what they are told. It was not an issue, but there's a small there's a number that have huge policymaking power and they're not elected. So if you don't like the policies they're doing, there's very little you can do. And that's a problem for democracy. Um, so we were aware of that problem that's there, but I think, uh, uh, we were sometimes a little bit less aware of even among some of the political appointees in our administration, not all were necessarily aligned, uh, with what the president was trying to do and with a reform agenda that was not just there to keep the trains running on time, but that was actually there to very thoughtfully dig into things and and change things and tinker with things in ways that work better. So, yeah, that is something that we saw the administration. I think we, I saw sometimes too. Um, where we were at. So yeah, um, that was one of the battles. And sometimes it was more intense than uh, the battles against the Democrats. Um, mm. We have your own internal uh, folks that you think are supposed to be with you, but are, are not always with you. So yeah, that was a frustration shared by, I think, many appointees in the administration who are aligned with the president and wanted to actually make change. Let's assume that uh, our, one of one of our guys gets elected in 2024. Let's just assume that the, a, an America first type gets a control of the executive branch. What does that person do differently? What, do, what needs to be done in the first hundred days vis-a-vis this particular 
issue. The staffing is policy issue. The snakes among us in the Republican Party, as my good friend Pedro Gonzalez at the Chronicle always says, the biggest fight is against the Republicans, man. It's against the existing Republicans. It's not against the Democrats. There's no progress to be made unless we we snuff out this this the awful strand of Republicanism that is actually against America. It is not America first in any way whatsoever. There is a internal war to be won first. What does the new executive leader of the United States government, who's a Republican, who is should be hopefully American first, do differently in 2024 if and when we retake the White House? What has to be different? What should they do? Well, um, one of the things we saw near the end of our administration is uh, the White House personnel office uh, came under control of the good guys, as I would call them. Now, those are folks who actually do have uh, the right values and who are bringing in good people. Um, I think we saw some great progress there at, in the end as, as we did that. Um, and my sense is that uh, President Trump wanted to be magnanimous and show an olive branch to the Republican establishment. So he let them bring some of their people in in the beginning. And the favor was not returned. They wouldn't even give any money for the wall, for Pete's sake. The number one campaign promise, they refused to even back our president on that. So um, they did not return the grace that he showed them uh, by letting some of their staff come in. So I think near the end, um, you know, things got a bit uh, better in that sense. And we had some good folks in charge of hiring and personnel. So uh, that was a great blessing. And I think if we're, uh, for example, if it's President Trump, uh, for example, in 24, I, I expect that you would see those good folks in charge again of the hiring. That's my personal guess without any uh, knowledge of things. Um, and I think then we would be in very good hands uh, with that set of folks in there. Um, I think... Uh, you know, you can get a sense of who's America first. I think there's ways of finding out, uh, looking at someone's resume and background and uh, having a conversation with them. So I think we've got to be very good on the vetting. I remember <laughs> I was kind of half jokingly, half seriously um, saying we should develop a psychological screen. And it is possible to do that. There are psychologists whose specialty is literally developing screening. So they can ask you questions like, would you rather um, go skateboarding or skydiving? Would you rather skip in the rain or jump in the pool? And they can tell from these questions where you are in certain things. Um, so I think if you could uh, somehow have a way to tease out where someone is ideologically or uh, something, I don't know if that's that's the exact way to do it, but somehow or another, you've got to be able to find out where people are at. I think we have a right to know that. So I think uh, maybe it's a longer term solution. Um, that's uh, something to do in a laboratory where we can try to tinker with that and see what we can get. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, we were at a good place near the end of our time, and I think we can just keep that up. We'll be in good shape. Uh, my friend and and repeat guest on the show, Cash Patel, one of those guys. And uh, if if and when we retake the White House, I expect to see him back and in charge and trying to get. I mean, I, chief of staff, I think, and he should get being able to push the agenda and the hiring and to uh, the, uh, the deep state is a real thing. You call it the entrenched professional class in the old days when I went to Georgetown school, foreign service. Oh, cause by the way, I'm also studied foreign, foreign service and international affairs. Uh, they said, uh, you know, they called it the, the technocratic class, the, the bureaucracy. And the funny thing is, I remember, man, the Washington consensus, woof, this thing, this globalist consensus, they put together the fusion of the neocons and the neoliberal liberals, which uh, Matt Stoller has done a great job as a Democrat outlining that fusion and why it's really just a corporate uniparty out there right now with libertarian economic values. Uh, one of the things that they kept saying was like, oh, well, if we're going to spread democracy to these countries, we have to help them establish bureaucracies. <laughs> <laughs> they have to have well, the bureaucratic strength in order to support democracy. Wait a second. Wait a second. You know, I've learned so much, man, uh, that I did a master's at Georgetown School of Foreign Service in the beginning of the 2000s. And, uh, man, I took all that as just, oh, Washington consensus. Oh, yeah, sounds good. Da, da, da. Establish bureaucracies, da, da, da. free trade, free capital, free currency movement, free people movement. Oh, yep, sounds good. Da, da, da. Makes sense to me, man. The models look great, you know, and it's just when you're young and you're open and you're literally paying money for these people to teach you these things, your brain is opened wide up to to absorb them and you kind of take them in uh, without you know, the, the, the experience and the critical thinking required in order to assess whether or not these things make any sense. But, but this one stands out in particular when we're talking about the deep state and we're talking about the entrenched bureaucratic, you know, class, the technocracy that we have, 
Uh, and and the fact that part of this Washington consensus is like we in so many words we have to instill a deep state in all these other countries so that they will quote support democracy. That is hilarious. Now on this same tip, you were nominated and you worked on the 1776 Commission. Is that correct? That is right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me about yeah. that because I believe I read the one and only publication that was produced out of there, which was fantastic. The 1776 little book, the pamphlet. Could you tell me what that was and, and what your experience was like there and what role does that sort of education have in turning things around for America? Yeah. Um, you know, as we know, the 1776 commission was, um, uh, created by president Trump to combat the 1619 project. Uh, the 1619 Project is a, an openly racist uh, revisionist history, which seeks to recast all of our history as a country as one of racism and slavery, um, predominantly, if not alone. Uh, and so if you're white, you're guilty. If you're black, you're a victim, basically, is what the 1619 Project uh, teaches. So it's, you know, it was interesting that when it came out, even many members of the left attacked it. They said it had gone too far. So it's very fascinating to watch the dialogue and interplay between them um, as that, that uh, thing emerged. Uh, so 1776 was to combat that. And very simply, it's all about uniting all of us, no matter what your background is, around the Constitution, Declaration, Bill of Rights, uh, the core things that unite us as a people. So teaching civics, uh, not, not this newfangled action civics, which is just another iteration of CRT. Uh, they're always inventing new words, but real actual civics um, so that the kids will uh, understand it doesn't matter what background we come from as Americans, we are defined by our Constitution, uh, Declaration and Bill of Rights. So it seeks to get that out there. Uh, there's a lot of momentum around it. Uh, Sleepy Joe did eliminate it, I think, as his first one of his first acts in uh, office. Um, but it still continues on in an unofficial capacity um, informally. And there's still a lot of momentum there. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's uh, good curriculums that are um that are popping up all around the country and so there's uh coordination happening there and uh yeah i mean i think this is you know it's it's tragic but it's also a, a beautiful gift from the left in our laps um uh, just when they expose themselves like this so uh people are standing up like never before at the school boards all around the country even small towns here in michigan they're having to um you know shut the school board meetings because the parents are showing up and uh, they really made the mistake of of activating the mama bears. You know, you go after someone's kids, you better watch out. Um, so it, it's very interesting to see. But yeah, this is an insidious uh, agenda with the CRT stuff. It is really bad. It dishonors a legacy of the civil rights movement, which said you judge a person by the content of their character. CRT says opposite. You judge a person by their race. So if you're white, you're guilty no matter what. Even if you were poor, even if no matter how hard you worked, no matter how you actually treat people and love people, um, doesn't matter. Uh, it's just based on your race, you're automatically guilty. And likewise, if you're black, you're automatically a victim, regardless of the decisions you made in life and the way you live your life and uh, the way you raise your kids and your family, et cetera. So it, it's it's bad stuff. And 1776, I think, has, has been good at, uh, as, at combating that. Uh, I've had Christopher Rufo on this show a number of times. I've talked to James Lindsay a number of times. I have written, you know, like I said, I was in education for a long time. I've written extensively about CRT, critical race theory, all of its impact. And I've said a million times, CRT in the classroom is going to be the biggest red pill dispensary in America. When you come home and little Jenny is being, you know, telling mom and dad at dinner that hopefully they've got dinner that they're, that she's at dinner table and she's telling them that the, she's been, she's the oppressor and they're talking about the pyramid of hate and all these things that activated the suburban moms in a way that unfortunately Trump's campaign seemed to have deactivated them in 2016, the white suburban moms, but they are definitely active and on board right now. And, uh, they, they are perhaps the most important swing vote, uh, that we've got moving forward here is making sure that all of these suburban moms and just all moms basically, uh, are defending their children, uh, from the pernicious, uh, folks in education. Now I have two more questions for you. One is on CRT. I have always felt that CRT erases using their language, erases people like you, sir. They, they seem to make it so that 
there's no actual opportunity or possibility for an African American to be successful. And I wonder what you say to that personally and what you would say to that on a policy level, which is how can it be the way they're describing it? How do you explain somebody like John Gibbs when what you're saying is, is everything is you know, designed to prevent people like John Gibbs from existing? What, what is your personal reaction to that? What is your policy reaction to that? And the last question is gonna be, what are you gonna do for the people of Michigan? Yeah, I mean, it's a uh, very good points. Um, uh, black success is something they can't look at uh, because it goes against our narrative. So they're going to uh, kind of ignore that and they're going to focus only on victimization. So someone like me definitely gets in the way of that. Um, and uh, they will say that you have Stockholm syndrome. I've been called a white supremacist. You know, it's, it's hilarious. Um, you know, they will go through and call you Uncle Tom and all the names that they want to call. But yeah, I mean, it, it is a major problem for them uh, when uh, black people are successful uh, because it goes against their agenda. And again, the way my parents were raised and the way I was raised, you don't need a billion dollar government program because you had grandma and grandma's belt. And you had dad and dad's belt <laughs> if you acted up and you had discipline in the home because of that. And, uh, you know, that can uh, solve a lot of these issues we're, we're facing. Uh, whereas they are trying to have a, a, a huge communist style government superstructure to monitor your thoughts, all your words. If you say something and approve, like all lives matter, uh, fire you from your job. Um, that's how they're trying to approach this, which will not work. And it also creates a dystopian, uh, you know, future. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a big problem. I remember once, I think it was on CNN, there was a, a gentleman who was, happened to be a black and he was talking about promoting CRT and he was all in favor of it. And I think they freeze framed it and found he was wearing something like a $10,000 ring or a very, very expensive ring. And I think Tucker caught that and pointed out the just amazing hypocrisy of it. Um, and the Black Lives Matter uh, woman, I forgot her name, buying a $1.4 million house, or I think they said multiple houses perhaps. Um, it just, it's almost comical at this point, but yeah, it's, it's a major problem for them. Uh, and they have to explain how in the past, when there was much more segregation and racism than today, the black crime rate was much lower and the black families are much more intact. So how do they explain that um, if racism is caused by everything? So it doesn't even pass basic logical reasoning. But, you know, in our society, this COVID stuff has shown that people will believe almost any kind of propaganda. Uh, so they'll get some people to believe it. Uh, but I think, like you said, there's also going to be a lot of red pills. Uh, people are going to look at this stuff and say, this has gone too far. Um, it's just absolute nonsense. So... Uh, yeah, it, it really is uh, uh, quite insane. It is, it is insane. It's crazy making, right? Like people like you and me, and, and I discourage people from doing this all the time. We try to uh, use a rational filter to assess irrational behavior. And it's hard to get past. You're like, no, but just wait. Like maybe there's another reason. Maybe there's another angle. No, wait. No, it really is that people are just being irrational. And it really is that they've been taken. Uh, and uh, Jordan Peterson expressed, I, I believe, a Jungian concept where he says, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. And we have seen that very powerfully uh, it happening here in America right now, because you and I both know guys, people who were five, seven, eight years ago, totally normal, totally sane, have a normal life, normal conversations, see the world similarly, have varying disputes on on minor policy levels, who are now absolute freaking nutters, who have just completely yeah. seemingly lost all rational uh, thinking and critical thinking skills. And, it, and it's sad to see. It's sad to see. My last question for you, John, is what are you going to do specifically for the people of Michigan? Why are you running for Congress in the 3rd District? And when you're done with that, tell everybody how we can support you, where we can find you, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Um, you know, after we got out of the administration uh, due to our involuntary change of employment uh, <laughs> and this past January, uh, I was planning on doing some work for a think tank and kind of uh, laying low and uh, uh, perhaps uh, staying in the D.C. area. But uh, some friends from our former White House called and said, would you like to take a, a run at uh, Peter Meyer, who uh, voted to impeach President Trump? I said, let me think about it, let me pray about it, uh, which I did, and decided to go ahead and do it. Uh, it's something I had not necessarily been planning on doing and uh, interrupted my relatively what I thought would be comfortable plans, but I said, 
I think the nation needs this. Um, I've, I've been serving in Japan. I served in the administration. So this is just an extension of what I've already been doing and yet in a different realm. So I um, decided to do it for that reason. And I think it's just about leadership. Uh, Peter Meyer, as his very for, first vote as a U.S. congressman, voted to impeach President Trump. Now, people can think what they will about uh, Trump and uh, whatnot, but people, people like him because he was willing to stand up and try to actually change something. And the people in our district who voted for Peter Meyer trusted him to be part of that movement of not just accepting the status quo, but actually um, standing up and trying to change things and uh, creatively tinker with things to get them working in the ways that we've been talking about uh, for the past uh, uh, hour here. So that's what we, that people wanted. But Peter Meyer backstabbed his constituents when he voted to impeach uh, President Trump. He's no longer providing leadership and he's therefore no longer representing his people. Uh, he voted for the January 6th panel, which is simply political uh, warfare. Um, he voted to uh, 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 censure Steve Bannon. Um, they're going after, I believe they're going after him and many others, not just him, Mark Meadows and many others for political reasons. Um, he stood behind that. Uh, when Jill Biden came to visit Michigan, he met her at the bottom of the stairs of the airplane. Even our governor, who's a full-fledged communist, wasn't there, but he was there to meet the uh, Joe, so it's just very bizarre stuff. And I think all those things point to the fact that he's no longer as interested in representing the people who voted for him. And so I think we need someone who can. And I think um, I have what it takes. I've been in D.C. I've been in the swamp. I fought rhinos. Um, I know how the government works. I know regulations. I know statutes. Uh, that's what I did during my time in the administration. So I know how all this machinery works. Um, I also know our people here in West Michigan. Um, I was born and raised in Michigan, so I, I know our our. Uh, our folks and I, I know what people want. So I'm meeting lots of people these days and just getting to know um, uh, what the issues are and things. So I also have that. And so I think um, with my service in Japan, um, knowing how to how to communicate things uh, to people who are from a very different background um, in ways that they understand, not the way that I want to communicate it. I think that's very useful here as well. So I just think a lot of things that God has put in my life have, have kind of come together. And I think uh, make me uh, well suited uh, to represent our folks over here. Um, and I think that Peter Meyer, um, while he may be a good person individually, I think politically has really chosen to uh, not represent the people that voted for him. And so I think that uh, it will be good for him to perhaps choose a different line of work uh, come 2022. And uh, uh, the folks who are actually going to get in there uh, represent the just increasing number of people who are sick of this garbage and the way that things are going. Uh, let us get in there and, and, and do the work. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's it. And, uh, I think we're going to have a, a good time doing it. I believe in you, John, how do we get people to support you? Where should we send people? Where's the donate button? How do we get you some more support? Where should people go to learn more, et cetera? Vote John Gibbs.com. That's a vote John Gibbs.com. Uh, it's like Gibbs, like the Bee Gees, uh, if you want to know the spelling. So, yeah, votejohngibbs.com. Please check it out. Um, I've got my social links there if you want to give. Um, uh, my opponent is relatively wealthy, uh, but it's not going to be enough for him to win. Uh, so we do need a war chest in order to go against him. So we do need uh, your contributions. Uh, so please do go ahead and give. And more than that, we need your prayers. So please, all the folks of faith out there, do pray that God would open the door up here and um, that we'd have not only myself, but a historic wave. Uh, some people think 70 to 90 seats. I don't know. That would be great, uh, but just that uh, we'd have great folks get in there and that we would uh, just be able to finally actually change stuff and, and move things in the right direction. VoteJohnGibbs.com. Excellent, John. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. I love your insights. I think we see a lot of things the same way. Uh, happy to support you in any way whatsoever in the future. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And, and good luck to you. Thank you, Jack. Thanks for having me on. It was a really great discussion. I really appreciate it. All right. My pleasure. Guys, thank you very much out there. I appreciate everybody tuning in. John, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, guys, follow, share, like, retweet, send out, email, tell your friends, tell everybody about it. Help us beat the algorithm, lock down on us, and get the word out there for, for John. Uh, spread the word on the podcast. Hit subscribe wherever you're listening. Special thanks to all the audio podcast listeners. You've been here with me since the jump. I appreciate your support. Thanks to all the support to everybody out there on Twitter. And uh, with that, we are out. On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. 
best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. 